Welcome to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Uh, and we have little flag things. Square Pod Save the World for the YouTube audience. Yeah. Um, Pod Save the World things. Hey, you're welcome, yeah. audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, ben, feisty State of the Union. When we were talking about it that day, I did not expect Joe Biden to come out swinging. Yeah, I don't know if Dr. Ronnie's back in the White House. Uh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He never left. Uh, Fiery. Every single headline was like fiery. This fiery. fiery that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, essentially, what they did is they picked like ten to fifteen fights and just you know put them together in one speech. I like that. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that uh, very well-meaning but annoying lawyers would have told us we were not allowed to do in the Obama days. That's true. Actually, uh, there was uh, not a lot of hesitancy to draw a contrast, um, which again, like I think it's the right move. Um, and it's an election year, so you have to do it. And it's the reality. And and frankly, on things like Ukraine, I mean, <laughs> it's also legislative. You know, it's like right. they're, they're blocking legislation. You know, I'm um, sorry you don't like being called out on that. Uh, Mike Johnson looked like he was kind of receding back into his chair and growing smaller throughout yeah, the course he of sad. the day. Yeah, very sad, sad Mike Johnson. Yeah. yeah, but the whole idea of like, I don't even remember what constitutes a Hatch Act violation necessarily, but Trump posted the RNC from the White House grounds. So I feel like yeah. that should sort yeah. of end the discussion. Well, I know. <laughs> we used to get all these ethics briefings and then this guy's like literally having his political convention on the South Lawn and tweeting out images of the PDB from his uh, of personal Twitter. Yeah, 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 details, yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, we're going to talk about the State of the Union a bit more because we're going to talk about Biden's new plan to get aid into Gaza that he laid out in that speech. Uh, Biden's Rafa Redline and Netanyahu's rebuke to basically all U.S. policy, yep. uh, current and past. Uh, we'll also talk about Trump's fake state visit with Viktor Orban down in Florida and why Viktor Orban matters and we talk about him so much. Uh, we'll get into the fight in Congress over banning TikTok, some big political news out of Portugal and Turkey, kidnappings for ransom in Nigeria, uh, and an embarrassing failed effort to amend Ireland's constitution. And then what everyone's been waiting for, Ben, the Photoshop saga heard round Kensington yeah. Palace. Don't worry. We're going to spend a, a good bit of time. I'm hoping this. for like 40 uh, minutes. Yeah, from yeah, yeah. <laughs> we may need, you know, we almost, I almost proposed a bonus pod. Just on um, the Photoshop? But l- l- thankfully, it was co- close enough to Tuesday that I thought, you know, in good conscience, I could wait. <laughs> Not to get ahead of ourselves, but someone uh, photo- <laughs> tweeted out a picture of King Charles <laughs> with a caption, I too like to play with Photoshop, and they just put him like a pack <laughs> of sausages for his hands. <laughs> Some really good comedy uh, here. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. And then, Ben, you just did our interview. What are folks going to hear? Yeah, I talked to uh, Renata Segura, who is the uh, deputy director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the International Crisis Group. Um, we talked about Haiti, um, obviously a horrific situation, and I thought it'd be good to have someone come on and really break down what is happening in Haiti, um, who are the key players, why are the gangs making their move now, what can be done internationally, what should the U.S. be doing, uh, what should the political transition be in Haiti, the prime minister is now uh, acceded to this pressure to step aside. Um, so it's a really good lay down of what's happening and i wish there was better news but there's there's not it's pretty pretty grim it is dark man yeah. uh, over the weekend i mean just watching the reports of the the gangs attacking the airports you yeah know, taking over basically all of the capital it's really scary stuff yeah i mean it sounds like from talking to renata and, and icg's had uh a person on the ground in port-au-prince um they essentially the gangs control the city pretty much now uh, which is terrifying yeah uh, one thing before we get to our news on Gaza, I just did want to give a shout out to Mstislav Chernov, uh, the Ukrainian journalist and director of the film 20 Days in Mariupol, which is about the beginning of the full-scale Russian invasion back in 2022. The, the film won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Uh, he was a guest on the show on February 21st, so I think that had something to do with it. Can I make a point here? Yeah, this please. is the second year in a row, because uh, we had That's the right. Navalny director um, and some of the Navalny film uh, participants on before last year's Oscars and they won. So Pod Say the World, two for two, all you publicists out there. I was going to say, Hollywood Keep PR in mind people. who delivers the uh, Oscar. It is this podcast. Yeah. You're trying to sell some new Matt Damon movie? No. Come get here, him on here. Come here. Yeah. Get Matt Damon on. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, all right, Matt. We'll talk about Tom Argo, Brady. Argo, fuck yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's go to gaza in the state of the union yeah. so okay in the state of the union president biden announced that the u.s is planning to build a floating pier off the gaza coast to facilitate aid deliveries into gaza it's going to take about 60 days or at least 60 days to construct this pier uh biden says no u.s boots will be on the ground in gaza so it's not clear to me ben who's going to distribute the aid who will provide security over this entire operation you have to imagine after um afghanistan 
in the tragedy at the Abbey Gate where a suicide bomber killed 13 U.S. service members, injured hundreds more people, um, the Biden team is going to be extremely worried about the safety of the people involved in this operation. Um, There was a report in the Jerusalem Post over the weekend that said that the idea for delivering aid by sea actually came from Netanyahu himself, uh, that it was raised as far back as October, was discussed by Biden and Bibi directly in January. So I don't know if that's true or not. Um, Netanyahu uh, refusing to let more aid trucks into Gaza because the Israeli yeah. far right opposes it, and then forcing the U.S. to construct a floating pier <laughs> yeah, yeah. to you know bail him out kind of tracks with how he operates. But I don't know, what, what do you make of this proposal? I, I, I mean, look, uh, on the one hand, anything that can facilitate the delivery of aid into Gaza um, makes sense to explore. Um, if this gets more aid into Gaza more efficiently from Cyprus, which is where a lot of this aid comes from, um, that could help. That said, um, this is one of those announcements that, again, highlights the shortcomings of the existing policy, though, because clearly it'd be more efficient to just drive trucks across the border in Rafa. I mean, trucks that are waiting there. Yeah. Ready there, to cross. So, so you're basically spending a lot of money and time. And you don't have time, by the way, two months, you know, you've got famine conditions already before an Israeli military operation in Rafa. Um, I, it, it would be better if you want to get aid and to just drive trucks in across the border from Rafa. And uh, I guess you can't do that if the Israeli military operation is going to go forward in Rafa. But if the U.S. wants to get aid and that's what I would be doing. This feels like, once again, we're kind of adding on to a policy that is not addressing the underlying issue, which is the military operation, the need for a ceasefire to get aid in. Um, that's the first point. The second point is that on the administration of this, you know, the U.S. I think is still not kind of turned back on the UNRWA funding, uh, which we talked about. Other countries have started to do this, by the way. I think Canada recently joined Sweden, uh, yeah. Canada and Sweden. UNRWA has the capacity to deliver aid. All the aid delivery mechanisms in Gaza have been through UNRWA uh, for years. And the idea that we're shutting all that down to investigate these few people that were involved in October 7th, when again, as we talked about, there are thousands and thousands of UNRWA employees. Again, we, we're, so we're building a pier while we're like cutting off the aid delivery people in Gaza and not driving trucks across the border. I mean, again, glad to have the pier, but that's really not going to make the difference that's necessary here. And, and you know, I think that's why, you know, they're, they're in that circumstance where they're, the policies are, are not making anybody happy. Um, you know, and that's why I think you've had a bit of a, uh, a lukewarm reaction to this. You know, yeah. And did you see that Netanyahu is basically denying that there's near famine conditions? He he did this long interview with Politico that we'll get into. He said, "quote uh, We don't have that kind of information. That's not the information we have, and we monitor it closely. More importantly, it's not our policy. Our policy is to put it or to put in as much humanitarian aid as we could. That's just absolutely it's not, not true. true. Their their own uh, leadership was saying things like no food." You know, they were announcing the policy of cutting off food and fuel into Gaza. Right. And there's right wing um, protesters blocking these aid deliveries yeah. and preventing them from happening. Yeah. And so you and I have talked again about this, but his ability to go on U.S. media in particular and just kind of lie about things um, and do it in, you know, uh, accessible language for the American audience um, is part of his selling point back home. I'll be the front man for the far right in this country. You'd rather have me on TV in the U.S. than Ben Gavir. That's kind of his last argument for being prime minister. And uh, unfortunately, it seems to be working for the guy right now. Yeah. And so, again, listeners to this show will not be surprised to hear that Biden and Netanyahu are not aligned on the big policy questions. Uh, but that fact was spelled out again over the weekend in these uh, a pair of interviews. So um, the first big difference is over the potential Israeli invasion of Rafa, which is that city in southern Gaza, where 1.4 million people are sheltering, and as, as Ben just mentioned, where aid crosses from Egypt into Gaza. During an interview with MSNBC on Saturday, President Biden said an Israeli invasion of Rafah was a red line for him. Here's a clip. I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical. So there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. Sort of like red line-ish. Well, yeah. And I mean, I don't know if he meant to state it 
exactly as he did. It's but like a highlighter. Basically like saying blurry if line. there are another 30,000 people killed on top of the already 30,000 people killed, then that'd be a red line. I mean, it didn't, I don't know. It, they kind of walked back the idea of a red line. And I loved. think the U.S. press has gotten addicted to the to idea red lines, of a fucking yeah, red yeah, line. Just, no president yeah. no president should ever say the word I red just line. Never um, repeat that again. Uh, but look, I, what, what I take away from it to, to substantively is he's trying to say that the Israeli military operation in Rafah would be some kind of breaking point uh, right. vis-a-vis Netanyahu. I think the question is, well, first of all, I think that should have already happened. Um, we've talked about, and in prepping for the show, Tommy, I mean, it's frustrating. We've been talking about these differences on the military operation Rafa and the Palestinian state issue for a long mm-hmm. time. These differences have been pretty you know, obvious, staring us in the face for a while. Um, and the challenge here is that they seem to not want to admit that they need to change their policy. You know. And you and I have been in the White House. It's hard to come out and say, you know what? We tried it this way. We tried to kind of hug BB and counsel him in private, and that didn't work. And so now we're changing. And instead, you're always kind of trying to explain why this is no. Yeah, this is an, for an inflection this point. This is an evolution of the policy. Yep, and, yep. Um, but I think what he's saying is that there'll be some consequence if the military operation Rafa goes forward. Um, what that consequence is, I mean, he kind of for the first time hinted at uh, certain restrictions on weapons. I mean, because. Right. He notably said, I would never cut off the Iron Dome. It's a missile defense. Which is so. missile defense. Which, like, that's, that's defensible. Nobody has said, you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, who's been the most outspoken and I think in line with our position in terms of saying cut off military assistance, even Bernie said, well, we can keep giving them the Iron Dome because you want to protect against right. rockets. Um, but the question is, would you cut off all offensive military assistance? Yeah. Um, I think you should. Would you vote for a ceasefire resolution at the United Nations? I think you should. I think we should be doing that now, frankly. Yeah. Um, so the the question remains for Biden, one, does the military operation Rafa go forward? And if it does, how substantive is this break? I, I think, you know, just saying we don't like this and we don't like Netanyahu is not going to cut it anymore and n- never was going to cut it. Yeah. And it, and it gets worse. I mean, so on Sunday, Netanyahu was asked about Rafa during uh, this interview he did with Axel Springer, which is the parent company of Politico. Uh, when asked about a Rafa invasion, he said, we'll go there. We're not going to leave them. Uh, them being the remaining Hamas forces in Rafah. Uh, Netanyahu then seemed to respond to Biden's red line comments. Here's a clip. We'll go there. We're not going to leave them. Uh, you know, I have a red line. You know what the red line is? That October 7th doesn't happen again. Never happens again. And to do that, we have to complete the uh, destruction of the Hamas terrorist army. In that interview, uh, Bibi also firmly rejected a two-state solution, saying, quote, uh, Israeli people also support my position that says that we should resoundingly reject the attempt to ram down our throats a Palestinian state. That is something that they agree on. Um, so to your point, Ben, Axios reported that if Israel does go into Rafah, the U.S. is considering imposing restrictions on some U.S.-made weapons by the IDF. Uh, they're considering not vetoing a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. But uh, again, I'm, I'm with you. Like, I would like to see those steps taken now to prevent this Rafa operation from happening. And there's just kind of, no one seems to address the broader, more substantive yeah. break on the creation of a Palestinian state. And, you know, they, they haven't even, like Bibi and Biden have not spoken in nearly a month. They're clearly not aligned on short-term and long-term strategy. And yet, it, like you said, it does feel like the U.S. policy is kind of just on autopilot. It's on autopilot. And again, it's because y- you would have to acknowledge that the approach of hugging Bibi, which is literally their stated policy, um, hasn't worked. Do you want to hug that guy? I don't want to hug that guy. No, he's Uh, creepy as fuck. He's creepy as fuck. And and like he's saying, you know, this red line, you know, macho talk that he does, um, they don't need to invade Rafa to prevent October 7th from happening. You know, October 7th happened because Bibi fucked up, because Bibi let his guard down, because Bibi moved a bunch of troops from the border with Gaza up to chase around uh, settlers who want, were committing violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, so what Rafa would do is cause a humanitarian catastrophe. And um, and and look, in terms of the bigger picture here, politically, first of all, I, I, Tommy, I'm beginning to have nightmares about what would it, what a tragic irony it would be if an American Democratic president lost re-election because he was unwilling to fully break with Bibi Netanyahu. You know, that's kind of my worst nightmare in yeah. life. Um but I think that, that, that that's a real consideration. Um, obviously, more substantively importantly is the humanitarian situation and the, the policy. 
And I think what the U.S. needs to do is, is actually start working on behalf of its own policy. Right now, it's been trying to kind of convince Israel to, to support things that BB doesn't support. You know, you know, don't go into Rafa, support a Palestinian state. We should have a view. Like, we want to move aid into Rafa with trucks. We want to start working for the construction of a Palestinian state, which has been U.S. policy for over two decades. decades yeah. You know, this is not ramming down the throat something that, we, that the whole world has supported for a very long time. Um, and just start working in that direction, you know, and if you have to work around Bibi, you have to work around him. Would I prefer an Israeli government that is a partner in that? Sure. Um, and by working around it, I mean just what, what is a, a vehicle for getting aid into Gaza? What is the kind of work that needs to be done to build up an alternative Palestinian leadership? What is the option on the table for some kind of recognition, de facto uh, or more specific, of, of Palestinian borders for a state? Um, these are things where the U.S. can have a view, um, and and just thinking you're going to get BB to go along with it. I mean, this no. guy's gonna. He has. He's full of shit. He says. He, said, he says wants not, Joe Biden to lose the election. He does. He said not going to Rafa would be the equivalent of Allied forces in World War II not going to Berlin. That is the craziest comparison I've ever heard. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Berlin, yeah. Post World War One Germany is not the same as a couple million people who are trapped in a tiny little yeah, sliver, largely of civilians. Street. Yeah. Also, Ben, you and I, you know, we have both dealt with the people online who constantly suggest that like all the death tolls that come out of Gaza are made up because it's from the Hamas-run health ministry. In that interview that Netanyahu did with Axel Springer, he says that Israel has killed thirteen thousand uh, uh, Hamas fighters. And that they've also killed maybe one to one and a half civilians per combatant, which would put the total number of deaths uh, at 26,000, which is right around where the Hamas health ministry says. I, I think everyone agree, probably everyone who's watching this closely thinks the actual death toll is much, much higher than that. But for all the truthers out there, Bibi Netanyahu thinks that at least 26,000 people have been killed in this conflict in five months. And 15,000 children have been killed. So uh, the Hamas combatant figure doesn't add up, you know, unless you think a bunch of, you know, I mean, ugh, it's just, it's gross that we're arguing about what, you know, what, fine, know, how many children is enough for you? You know, like what, what is too much? I mean, this, this is not working people, you know? And, and again, we've said this every time when I say it again, like the hostages, if that's your concern, you're not going to get them, you're not going to free them uh, more efficiently through invading Rafa than you would through a negotiation. But, yeah. You know. Two other strange things. So in that interview, Netanyahu seemed to leave open the possibility of ex uh, extending military operations into Lebanon. Yeah. Because the people who evacuated northern Lebanon want to go home. But he said, you know, if we need to make sure they're safe through military means, we'll do so. Um, the other strange thing that happened today. So every year, the intelligence community does this annual threat assessment where they release this 40 page unclassified document of all the threats in the world. And then they testify. And it's this yeah. bizarre. I don't know why they do it, to Pe be totally honest. Uh, to give the press like scary stories to write for a couple yeah, of Yeah, justify their budgets. Yeah. Um, but in the, uh, the threat assessment document that came out on Monday, uh, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, cited concerns about distrust of Netanyahu's ability to rule. Uh, and it questioned his viability as a leader as well as his governing coalition going forward, which uh, was noticed and not appreciated by Netanyahu's government. But you've also seen huge protests in Israel against Netanyahu's government. I mean, thousands and thousands of people on the street demanding elections on the basis that Netanyahu failed and kind of lost his legitimacy because of what happened on October 7th and obviously because he's flailing around now. And so, you know, the this is not uh, just the opinion of the U.S. intelligence community. Netanyahu's approval ratings have been very low. He clearly doesn't have the confidence of a large number of, of the Israeli people, even Israeli people who may support a military operation. So, you know, it's one of those. I mean, the other thing that was in that threat report is that the, the United States might face an increased threat um, around no the world because of its support for Israel, which, again, is not a surprise. But, you know, some things are, you know, need to be stated, obviously. Yeah. One last clip uh, that's worth hearing from Biden's uh, interview on MSNBC. What's happening is he has a right to defend Israel, a right to continue to pursue Hamas, but he must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting, I, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world. It's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. I mean, like, accurate, 
a good observation. I, I just, you know, I think that needs to be, if, if you really think he's hurting Israel, then let's back that with action. I think well, that's the, sort of the final word. Yeah, on this. we're not a passive actor. I right. mean, the final word I'd say is that we're, we're supplying a lot of, if not most of the offensive weapons that they're using to, to hurt Israel. So, so it, you know, it's not just commenting on something that, that we are not a part of. You know, we, we have a, we, we should be able to use our leverage if we think what they're doing is wrong. You know, the substance has to follow that comment, you know? Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, there'll be better news on this next week. I mean, yeah. everyone was hoping there'd be a ceasefire before Ramadan. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, uh, let's case. hope that they pull that off. Fingers I mean, crossed. That would be the best possible outcome. Uh, okay, Ben, let's turn to, uh, to Mar-a-Lago uh, <laughs> because we talk a lot about Hungarian uh, dictator, soft fascist, this is what people like to call him, Viktor Orban on the show. Um, we cover him for a bunch of reasons. He's a Putin stooge. He's a huge pain in the ass for the European Union, for NATO. He was at the vanguard of uh, demagoguing Muslims and refugees to gain political power. And he's also seen by uh, conservatives, especially Republicans in the U.S., as the model for how to crush democracy, cement your control over a country, uh, and pervert or destroy its institutions. So again, that brings us to Mar-a-Lago, where Trump hosted Orban and his daughter for like a pretend state visit yeah. last week. Yeah. Um, here's a clip of Trump praising Orban to the assembled uh, audience. There's nobody that's better, smarter, or a better leader than Viktor Orban. He's fantastic. He's the, as you know, the Prime Minister of Hungary. And does a great job. He's a non-controversial figure because he said, this is the way it's going to be, and that's the end of it, But right? He's the boss. And you know, he's a great leader, fantastic leader in Europe and all over the world. There is- <laughs> the music <just laughs> the, the, softly the, playing. The soul man. But <laughs> I, I'm a big Sam and Dave guy, but like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Trump, he also just sounds so jealous whenever he's talking about like Xi Jinping yeah, or yeah, any dictator yeah, that yeah. could just rule by fiat. Yeah. Anyway, so Orban, you oh. know, d- does the whole reach around on social media afterward. He says Trump <laughs> <laughs> commanded respect in the world, uh, created the conditions for peace during his presidency. There was peace in the Middle East and peace in Ukraine. We need him back more than ever. Uh, Orban also told Hungarian state media that Trump is a man of peace. He will not give a penny in the Ukraine-Russia war. Therefore, the war will end because it's so obvious that Ukraine cannot stand on its own feet. So, I don't know. Like, everything about this is just so weird. He, the, you're just doing a cosplay state yeah. visit at Mar-a-Lago. Everything from, like, the arrival photos to the flags to the motorcades driving up. Like, I just, so the Sam and Dave soundtrack, you know? <laughs> just don't know what to make of this. All right. I haven't done a book plug in a while, okay? Go for it. Uh, but, you know, uh, to those of you who are newer worldos, uh, I wrote a book a few years ago. It's a few years ago now. God, we're getting old. Um called After the Fall, uh, about the rise of authoritarianism in the world. And it had uh, started with a huge section on Hungary because Hungary is the template um, that Republicans have used. And again, to be specific, the way that started is, you know, essentially Orban gets elected um, his second term uh, time in as prime minister um, in 2010 and, you know, packs the court with right wing judges, redraws the parliamentary districts to entrench his party in power changes the voting laws to make it easier for his supporters to vote and you know harder for his opponents to vote, enriches some cronies through corruption who then finance all of his politics, buy up the media and turn it into kind of a right-wing mouthpiece, use social media to villainize his opponents and wraps it all up in a big old nice bow of us versus them nationalism, you know, us, the true Hungarians and them. Real Hungarians. Yeah, the real Hungarians versus the, the you know, liberal elites and the Muslims and the, you know, immigrants and George Soros. Um, so it sounded very familiar. In other yep. words, like this literally is the playbook, the exact playbook that the Republican Party has been running in this country. They want to turn this country into a one-party autocracy um, li- that has the veneer of elections, but essentially all the levers to power are corruptly controlled by their party. So th- we need to take this seriously because this is like having Mussolini at the White House in the 30s. You know, like yeah. th- I mean, th- George you know, Bush refused to meet with Viktor Orban. Yes, yeah, he wouldn't invite him for a state visit. Yeah, Trump th- did in 2019. Yeah, this is this is um, this is crazy shit. You know, and, and you know, it's all normalized. But like, literally, this is you know, uh, announcing your intention to be a, a, a soft authoritarian. Not even soft, really. Viktor Orban can be pretty hard assed about it. Uh, never mind the fact that you know. Cutting off all aid to Ukraine and quote unquote ending the war notes, ending you know Ukraine's capacity ending to resist country, yeah. uh, Vladimir Putin. So these are things that have like very high stakes, and sometimes they can seem less like that because there's like this kind of comical facade of Mar-a-Lago and a, a soul man playing in the backdrop. But like you know, I 
think I'd take it pretty seriously, you know? It's just, yeah, it is worth watching. I mean, it's CPAC and all these other events. Javier Mille, I think, went to Mar-a-Lago. There's just this little crew of kind of populist right-wing dictators that is always getting together. And it's not just Trump. I mean, Viktor Orban was in uh, D.C. the day of Biden's State of the Union giving a speech to the Heritage Foundation. Yeah, and this is, to build on what we were saying after CPAC, I'd like to see the center left and progressives uh, and even like, you know, the occasional mods um, get each other's back like this. You know, if yeah. these people are not, Victor Orban is not nervous about defying Joe Biden and endorsing Donald Trump. Like we should do more in this country and around the world to kind of spotlight, support, platform good leaders of even smaller countries. You know, they've gone a long way to building up Victor Orban and his stature globally. We don't do the same thing when we have like a, you know, a Jacinda Ardern in New yeah. Zealand or uh, you've had some pretty good leaders recently in, um, in Central and Eastern Europe. Like they, they, we got some good young uh, progressive leaders in Latin America. Um, I'd just like to see us do more to support one another in the way that they do, maybe without the Mar-a-Lago backdrop and the, the Soul Man soundtrack. Yeah, but, maybe you don't need Soul Man. A different Man. soundtrack. We have different, I mean, I like Soul Man. I, um, Sam and Dave is, you know, uh, it was, it, it was, no, it's Hold On, I'm Coming, or is it Soul? Yeah, sorry, it's Hold On, I'm Coming. I don't know why I keep saying Soul Man. I don't know. I don't um, know the names of any songs. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah, know yeah, Spotify yeah. like pumps into my brain. Well, I just had, uh, I had that cassette. I'm old enough that the Blues Brothers soundtrack, you know, had a bunch of Sam and Dave, uh, the best of Sam mm-hmm. and Dave. You yep, know, yep. Hold On, I'm Coming, Soul Man, like a bunch of good tracks on there. So I, I recommend that. <clears throat> also old enough to remember when people freaked out about the Logan Act and, you know, pres- people pretending they were <laughs> yeah. conducting foreign policy on behalf John of the United Kerry, States. Like, <laughs> John, John Kerry, like, met some European once uh, during the Trump years yeah, and they wanted to, to throw him in prison. The guy. And meanwhile, Donald Trump is... <laughs> Like undermining U.S. foreign policy. Yeah. Yeah. Or one's like, oh, yeah, we'll yeah. cut off all aid to Ukraine. Um, in more Ukraine news, uh, just worth quickly pointing out that the Ukrainian government is furious at the Pope for seeming to suggest that they should surrender. The Vatican says the Pope was just advocating for a ceasefire deal and saying, like, it takes real courage to, he said, wave the white flag, which certainly sounds like yeah, surrender, yeah, but, yeah. you know, to have negotiations when you're losing and save lives that way. Uh, and the Biden administration announced another $300 million package of military aid to Ukraine. CNN reported they were able to fund this tranche through savings in weapons contracts, which is a reminder that literally no one understands the Pentagon budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, but it's also a reminder, frankly, though, that three hundred million is not fifty-six billion, which no. is a supplemental. So there's not a huge gap between being able to kind of cobble together the workarounds versus actually funding this. Yeah, as long as we're on sort of uh, threats to democracy, do you see that Trump is going to start getting intelligence briefings again now that he's a candidate? I saw that. Um, you know. I don't know why, you know, you feel the need to abide by norms, you know, uh, right. that when you're running against this guy. How does he have a clearance still? I, and when you steal classified documents okay. and store them in your toilet. And refuse to give and them back. And talk about them on tape to like, you know, right-wing journalists <laughs> yes. in Mar-a-Lago. I would think that you would have a hard time getting the SF-86 clearance, you know, I but just... I mean, I guess there's a version of briefings that can change, right? There's one that has like sensitive information in it. And then there's like a cliff notes of like, you know, here's the pod save the world version of the briefing, you know? Yeah, a Let, lot of open source. Let's hope it's the cliff notes version. Um, <laughs> Just summarizing Wall Street the, Journal yeah, articles. The, the, the Vox, uh, yeah. you know, thing. Uh, but, but yeah, I just, I don't know why. What, what's the downside to saying no? Zero. Then Trump comes out and says, he won't give me intelligence briefings. And you just say, so well, you yeah. You didn't read them when you were in the White House. And you're literally under indictment for stealing classified secrets. So maybe we uh, shouldn't give you classified secrets. Yeah. yeah. Adam Schiff says he hopes the intel community will dumb them down. I think they already do yeah, that for will. the yeah. candidates, right? You get yeah. more of the over, you know, arching you assessments get the wave tops. than you get like the, wave the, tops. Yeah. the sensitive stuff. That's true. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> still a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, it's still a bad idea. Because he'll still come out and talk about it. Yeah, yeah, and he'll probably try to hawk it to yeah. Mr. Orban. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Ben, let's talk about TikTok. The House of Representatives is advancing a bill that would force ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, to sell all but 20% of TikTok to a U.S. company or else it gets banned in the United States. So this bill passed, uh, remember this, Ben, the House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> the best name. Yeah, yeah. That's a thing that exists. Yeah, yeah. So the, <laughs> the bill passed that, that committee by a vote of 50 to Whoa, zero. Whoa, yeah, I wonder yeah. how it got through. Yeah. Uh, Biden says he supports the ban. Until recently, Trump also supported forcing an ownership change of TikTok. If you remember back in 2020, he issued an executive order banning U.S. companies from transactions with ByteDance because they were worried it would give the Chinese government access to sensitive data on Americans. Seems reasonable concern. Uh, but just days before the full House of Representatives is supposed to vote on this new TikTok ban proposal, Trump flip-flopped 
uh, and he did it on Truth Social saying, if you get rid of TikTok, Facebook, and Zucker Schmuck, we'll, <laughs> we'll double their business. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Why does everything feel like 2016 again? I, I hate uh, it. I, we're uh, trapped. We're trapped. Yeah. So, <laughs> trapped time is a flat circle. So <laughs> Trump does hate Zucker Schmuck. <laughs> That's well known. But a lot of people think that this change in policy might be good old fashioned corruption or donor influence. So Trump met with a guy named Jeff Yass. I don't know if it's Yass and <laughs> Jeff Yass Queen. He's a billionaire uh, conservative. He he gives tons of money to the club for growth. <laughs> Why did the, these people come out of the woodwork? This fucking, <laughs> there's always some billionaire MAGA guy that shows okay. up. You know. This dude, he, okay, so he funds the club for growth. He has a $20 billion <laughs> stake in ByteDance. So he's got a lot of skin in the game. So Trump denies talking with Jeff Yass or Yes or whatever his yeah, name is right. about TikTok. I'm sure. Yeah, but yeah, they sp- on that. <laughs> so I mean, as you probably have heard from people I know, yeah, you know, yeah. TikTok has bought up every lobbyist in Washington, yeah. including Kelly, Kelly and, and Conway. Conway. Yeah. So like a good mob boss, I'm sure. Like the <laughs> the deals happening between uh, the capos. Anyway, here's a clip of Trump talking about why he now opposes the TikTok ban during a recent interview with uh, CNBC. There are a lot of people on TikTok that love it. There are a lot of young kids on TikTok who, who will go crazy without it. There are a lot of uh, users. There's you know, a lot of good, and there's a lot of bad with TikTok. But the thing I don't like is that without TikTok, you can make Facebook bigger. And I consider Facebook to be an enemy of the people, along with a lot of the media. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Just to round this out, the intelligence community uh, in that global threat report that we talked about earlier mentioned TikTok. It says, quote, TikTok accounts run by PRC propaganda arm reportedly targeted candidates from both political parties during the U.S. midterm election cycle in 2022. And it added that China is demonstrating a higher degree of sophistication in its influence activity, including experimenting with generative AI. So stepping back, a lot of issues at play here. The first is national security and the Chinese government potentially being able to get our data or just control like the most important social media platform for yeah. young people in the US. The second is constitutionality and whether banning TikTok is actually a First Amendment violation. There's a lot of discussion there. Uh, and then there's just this good old influence peddling piece and this yeah. billionaire yeah. maybe buying off Trump's position. Any guess on what happened uh, with Trump or what is going to happen going forward or whether you think this is a good idea? Well, the guess is on what happened. Uh, you know, it's probably a combination of you know whatever billionaire is you know made whatever deal with Trump. I mean, it's it's just, like sometimes the thing that's obvious is what happened. Like maybe yeah. there's some super PAC that's going to get a big contribution. No some legal fees are going to be uh, relieved. I don't know what the hell the corruption is, but I'm sure it's there. And worth noting, Vivek Ramaswamy flip flopped the exact same way. Yeah, he, he called it digital fentanyl TikTok, and then he got several million from this guy to his super PAC, yeah. and then now he was it's on like TikTok, a so. digital cough medicine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I think that also. Um, interestingly, this time around, uh, my, you know, uh, anecdotal, uh, interactions suggested maybe Trump is hearing from his campaign that TikTok is maybe good for him. You know, last time he didn't like TikTok cause there were a lot of like resistance, uh, comedians making TikToks right. about Trump and or K-pop you know, fans, or K-pop messing fans with flooding. his events. This yeah. time around, I think you've got a lot of Gaza content that yes. is, um, understandably upsetting and angering uh, the very younger voters that uh, are turning off Joe Biden. I think, frankly, you have like a bunch of TikToks that make fun of Joe Biden for being old and stuff. And yeah. so maybe Trump's thinking like, well, actually, like TikTok might not be a net negative for me. It might be a net positive. My explainer um, and the Dalai Lama didn't do that well. I don't know why. Hmm. Well, my, my Uyghur genocide one didn't either. Well, this gets to the thing I was going to say, which is, and don't at me, I know the TikTok, you know, brigades can be like the Swifties here, so I'm going to be very careful about how I state this. But again, the thing that is, for years, what I've heard from the people that I, you know, look at this, um, you know, TikTok, the algorithms that, that drive what content people receive are a black box in China, yeah. essentially. And it is a platform in which what you receive is not as tied to who your followers are as other things, other platforms, right? Um, now, Meta, Instagram, um, Twitter have changed this as well recently where suddenly you start to see stuff that's not um, necessarily what you follow, but yeah, TikTok, you page. TikTok, you're being fed a, a, a feed um, by algorithms that, you know, are, are, nobody can see them uh, except the, the, the ByteDance engineers in, uh, in China. And, and that's a legitimate concern. Um, now, I don't think that the right outcome is banning it altogether. Because frankly, I think in all this information space, one thing I've learned the last few years is like, we're not going to like 
be able to turn back the clock to not having right. these platforms and not having disinformation campaigns. But I think there should be a real effort to try to get some transparency around uh, how information flows on TikTok, how the algorithms work. Um, the best way for that to happen is for there to be like a U.S. owned subsidiary where the all not only is the data stored in the U.S. Yeah. but the algorithms are in the U.S. That's where this is heading. It yeah. seems. I think that's the that's like a that is like a totally valid. You know, you don't have to be a member of the 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 select committee on the Chinese <laughs> Communist Party to think that maybe if young people in this country are being largely, you know, their number one information source is, you know, this platform and we don't really know how it works. Um, and it's emanating from a country that would want to fill young people in this country with division and anxiety, you know, that, that perhaps we should take a look at that. And by the way, this is what the Chinese government Chinese does do the too. same thing. They force yeah. you to open a yeah. Chinese subsidiary if, That's you right. be, if you're like Airbnb and you yeah. want to operate in China. Yeah. Um, I, I should say that, you know, it, it seemed like at the end of the Trump administration, they were trying to force a sale of TikTok to Oracle because I think Larry Ellison's a buddy. Ultimately, um, Oracle, I think they could cut this deal where they would just sort of store uh, American data at a place in Texas. I think it was called Project Texas, actually. Um, for what it's worth, there's been a bunch of reporting since that that attempt at creating a firewall is completely failing. The Wall Street Journal had a, a great report on this. And uh, this whole segment is drawn from great reporting by the Washington Post and, and CBS News and the Journal, by the way. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does... Well, I, where I In 2020, I felt like um, the conversation on a ban was a little more reasonable and understandable. Now, four years later, you have people who've built like lives, careers, yeah, relationships I, that's why on this I, platform. I, the, like, the best outcome is not a ban. Um, but again, the two issues are data. And, and first of all, just on the data point... Um, you know, the U.S. will spend all this money spying on countries. Like, imagine if you just had the massive data set of all the likes and, yeah, interest, you know, interest and, you know, anxieties of tens and tens of millions of Americans. Like, pretty good uh, vehicle <laughs> for data collection. So you want to be able to store the data in the U.S. And then again, you want to be able to understand how the platform is working through the algorithm. Um, and, and so that's the best outcome to work for yeah not a not an outright ban which i think would just piss people off and frankly then it'd just be replaced by some other similar platform yeah he's not wrong that jacques zucker schmucks <laughs> 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 the best line of better best line no one will ever top uh the 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 close the social network mark uh you're not an, not an asshole so stop trying so hard to be one <laughs> <laughs> the other the other good trump uh nickname the other day was slopinopolis He's yeah. got. He's. Get, I gotta say, he's getting his game back after de de sanctimonious sharpening up good, his, yeah. his knives. Yeah, yeah election year. Uh, so we'll watch this one. Uh, the vote in the House should be on Wednesday, which is when this comes out. Uh, the Senate has sort of a different view, so we'll see if they can. Pick yeah, I doubt. I doubt this will get through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ben, let's talk about some big political news coming out of Europe, uh, starting in Portugal, which held snap elections on Sunday. So the headline out of these elections is that the far right party, the Chega party. Uh, which translates to enough party, secured 18% of the vote despite being formed in 2019. Uh, according to the BBC, they ran on immigration and corruption, but you know the, the, they will not be able to form a government. But the takeaway should be that there's this growing strength uh, with these far-right parties as we head into elections for the European Parliament in early yeah. June. Yeah. And then in Turkey, uh, President Tayyip Erdogan told Reuters that the upcoming election on March 31st will be his last uh, Erdogan was recently reelected to a five-year term. That was in 2023. He's been president since 2014. Before that, he was prime minister for about a decade. So if he left the political scene, it would be a seismic moment. But I don't know. He's also a liar. So maybe we should doubt Yeah, well, I mean, on Erdogan, we'll see what he does. He's also kind of like his son-in-law. Like he's got like a, a nepotism pass it off, yeah. structure set up. And so he still might be, you know, whenever he exits the formal scene, he still may be the kind of power behind things. So we'll have to see how things go. Um, and yeah, the Portugal thing is in line with the kind of 20%, you know, window that we've seen for a lot of these far right parties. It's obviously concerning. You made the right point. I think the, the barometer of the strength of the far right across the continent will be seen in these European parliamentary elections because that's the rare election in Europe where everybody's voting because yep. they're voting for representation in Brussels. And that'll be a real test of strength. And then the next big turn will be the French election um, next year. Uh, or is it, what year is it? Uh, 25, is 25. it? 25. Uh, well, well, the next big t test will be the French election, which is coming up relatively soon, where Marine Le Pen you know, has a real shot too. So uh, keep an eye on this. As yes, always. scary one. Also, this reporting got me just kind of 
Googling around about Erdogan, seeing what he's been up to. Yeah. Uh, on Saturday, he said that Turkey firmly backs Hamas. He said it's not a terrorist organization. And he added, quote, Netanyahu and his administration with their crimes against <laughs> humanity in Gaza are writing their names next to Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin like today's Nazis. This isn't necessarily new rhetoric from Erdogan. He also said that he was going to host uh, Vladimir Putin in Turkey after the Russian elections. But it is just wild that this guy's <laughs> a member of NATO. He says things like this about yeah. the Israeli government. He's welcoming Putin to town. I mean, just friends like these, man. Well, what's so interesting about Erdogan, which we've talked about, is he kind of, he'll veer back and forth. Like he'll, he'll have his like uh, pro-Western quarter where he like goes right. to NATO meetings right. and lets, you know, Sweden and Finland into NATO and does something that we like. And then all of a sudden he's got Putin there. So he just tacks back and forth. And what's interesting, uh, you know, stepping back, um, a lot of these kind of medium-sized powers are doing this more and more, where they're kind of shopping around, diversifying, you know, Turkey, Brazil, India, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be buying Russian oil one day and then they'll yeah, be at a- Hedging some bets. Yeah, they're, they're hedging in all directions, right? And, and I think part of the reason they're hedging is, well, one, they can- you know, it's like a menu that they can shop from. What do I want from the Chinese? What do I want from the Russians? What do I want from the Americans and the Europeans? But the other thing is Trump. You know, I think everybody's kind of waiting to see what happens here. You know? Yeah. Uh, breaking news based on a text that I got a while ago, but I just mm. read. Uh, apparently RFK Jr. said that his short list for running mates are Jesse Ventura. Jesse, he's the, still the body, he's still... the mind Ventura. It's Kind of like Poor a wrestler 90s, turned governor yeah. of Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. he mm, has been. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Aaron Rodgers, Ben. Oh. Your, your quarterback, <laughs> New York Jets quarterback. Oh. Care to comment? Um, Care to comment on Aaron Rodgers? Uh, well, you Vice know, he'll probably like blow out his Achilles. and his, no and, jab and, and, ticket. Yeah, when he's announced uh, as VP, he'll blow out his uh, Achilles walking out onto the stage. <laughs> his uh, best day will be his first day. Yeah, it is. Th- I mean, this whole like Joe Rogan uh, wing of American society is, is, is endlessly fascinating to me. Actually, I saw Aaron Rodgers was recently on Joe Rogan. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the guy... Th- the irony of the do your own research guys, like not really yeah. seeming to do a lot of research. Aaron Rodgers not the kind of guy I want to do my research. Bums you know? me out. Yeah. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Nigeria, Ireland, and the royal controversy heard around the world. Okay, horrible news out of Nigeria, where over the past few weeks, hundreds of kids aged 8 to 15 years old have been kidnapped from several different schools by criminal gangs. It's just literally every parent's worst nightmare. Um, Unfortunately, these kinds of mass abductions have been an ongoing issue for Nigeria. According to a report in Al Jazeera, 1,400 children have been uh, abducted in Nigeria over the past decade. And then I'm sure a lot of listeners remember back in 2014 when the terrorist group Boko Haram abducted 276 schoolgirls from their dormitory. That led to the very well-meaning but ultimately uh, unsuccessful Bring Back Our Girls social media campaign. To this day, about 100 of those girls are still missing. Hopefully, with these recent abductions, uh, the outcome will be better because unlike the incident with Boko Haram, these more recent abductions have been mostly kidnappings for ransom, where these, you know, militant, not even militant groups, sort of like gang groups, uh, kidnap kids, uh, ransom their families, return them months later, you know, at exorbitant costs. Um, Nigerian President Tinubu, who was elected last year after running a campaign promising to end Nigeria's security challenges and end kidnapping, uh, condemned the abduction, saying, quote, the president directs security intelligence agencies to immediately rescue the victims and ensure that justice is served against the perpetrators of these abominable acts. Uh, the Nigerian military says, you know, they're trying, but they're spread too thin. They're unable to combat all of these armed groups and gangs uh, who have been able to take over enormous swaths of territory and basically just torment everyone living there. So just uh, an all around horrible situation that we wanted to highlight um, and something to watch. Yeah, and I think the broader context to watch, right, is one of the reasons why, um, uh, you know, I was down at South by Southwest um, with this International Crisis Group panel, and and the head of the International Crisis Group, Comfort Arrow, was on uh, with me, and and she used to be the Africa director, and she was talking about the the coups uh, in Chad and Niger and Mali and unfortunately other places, um, and and she made the point that one of the reasons why that has happened is you've had a breakdown in the big powers, like Nigeria has its own instability, which makes it harder to kind of be this uh, stabilizing force in the region at the same time that Libya and Algeria, which are above those coup countries, have had their own instability. Mm -hmm. The bigger point being that Nigeria is a little messy right now, and it it always has had issues with violence and corruption, 
But given the fact that it's bordered by Niger and Chad and it's the biggest country in Africa, the, the thing to watch is just, you know, does this kind of violence uh, foreshadow or indicate like a larger growing instability or is it manageable? You know, that's, yeah. that's the thing I'd watch in addition to obviously just the human, human cost. On top of that, I mean, we, last week we talked in depth about Sudan during the interview. Um, because of the civil war in Sudan, you have hundreds of thousands yeah. of people fleeing to other countries, including yeah. to Chad which was already unstable, right? You yeah. had a, the president of Chad was killed a couple of years ago while visiting troops on the front line. His son took over. There's sort of questionable legitimacy. There's been all sorts of authoritarian things happening. But when you have flows of, you know, hundreds yeah. of thousands, if not millions of people into a country, it's going to completely destabilize. Yeah. That's the thing is this stuff can, can spread. You yeah, know. it's spreading fast. Uh, this is not the important point, Ben, but uh, Lovett recently pointed out to us <laughs> That Mark Robinson, uh, the right wing nut job Republican nominee for governor of North Carolina, he's like a big Facebook guy. Facebooked a lot back in the day. In 2014, he weighed in on the Boko Haram abduction of the Nigerian schoolgirls. Uh, this is a thing he actually posted on Facebook. George Soros stole them girls. 11 exclamation points. This is a man who might be gov- he's currently lieutenant governor of North Carolina. <laughs> he's already elected statewide. Yeah, this is an interesting guy. Um, 11 exclamation yeah. points. A lot of hot takes emanating My from this guy. My God. Yeah, yeah, God. Fucking lunatic. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's turn to Ireland. Uh, we're an effort to update Ireland's constitution to make it less sexist, somehow failed miserably. Here is the backstory. So Irish voters were asked to vote on two different amendments to the constitution. First, whether to replace language in the constitution about marriage being the foundation of a family and replace it with a clause designed to make the definition more inclusive. So it says that marriage and, quote, other durable relationships are the foundation of the family. Seems reasonable. Uh, The second thing they were asked to vote on was to remove language that said a women's duties, quote unquote, should be in the home. Uh, That That, too. Yeah. It's a little odd, you know, constitutional provision. Real dated. uh, 1937 era language. Uh, Also, 60% of Irish women already in the labor force. So um, it's ludicrous on its face. So organizers timed the vote uh, on these two provisions to coincide with International Women's Day on March 8th. But both of the provisions went down. Uh, the, the change about women's duties was defeated with 73% of the vote, in part because the prime minister's proposed language uh, wasn't what had been vetted by activist groups or citizens' assembly meetings. <laughs> uh, and the changes to the definition of family was defeated by 68% of the vote, in part because conservative activist groups said that it could impact land inheritance rights somehow. I don't understand all of this. Turnout was low. Voters were confused. The campaigning yeah. was bad. So good news, a better what run campaign seems yeah. like I could get this done. Yeah. Bad news until then, Ireland is stuck with this 1937 constitution. Yeah, no, I, I, it sounds like this was just a poorly done campaign up, up against, you know, probably galvanized opposition. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it speaks to the need to like, you know, when you take your shot. Politics you, matters, man. Yeah, when you take your shot, you really got to aim and fire. You can't just think that the obvious rightness of your cause is going to carry you across the, the goal line here. But uh, I'm hopeful, you know, uh, I, I love the Irish. Still figure it out. I have confidence in the Irish. Now, we do need to wonder why I constantly pivot us from stories about Ireland into royal stories. I don't know that that's the best tick I have. Um, but here we go. Well, it's, I mean, like, give the people what they want, okay. including me, because uh, I want to talk about this. So you're our official royal correspondent. Yeah. That said, uh, thus far, we have avoided covering the stories about where is Kate Middleton. In part, at least to me, it felt like an instance of the internet being shitty to a person who was probably dealing with a health issue. Yeah. Uh, but now, bad Photoshop has forced our hand. I regret to inform you that we have to cover this. So- Here's what we know. Uh, Kate Middleton has not been seen in public since Christmas of last year. Uh, She had a scheduled abdominal surgery on January 17th. On January 29th, Kensington Palace announced she had returned home, but she's not returned to official duty since. Then her husband canceled an event in late February and it like set the internet on fire and people started speculating about where they might be or what happened to her. Uh, On March 10th, the palace released a photo of Kate with her children for British Mother's Day. The second it emerged, Internet Sluice said that is photoshopped, and it was photoshopped very poorly to the point where the Associated Press had to retract the photo, saying, "quote The photo shows an inconsistency in the alignment of Princess Charlotte's left hand." That was not the only inconsistency. 
Uh, there's Prince Charlotte missing part of her wrist, seemingly. Kate isn't wearing her wedding ring, and it looks like her arms are like a hundred feet long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Do you yeah, notice that yeah, part? Yeah, yeah, Maybe that's yeah. just me. No, uh, no, that's that, that. That you just took one of my takes. Okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, long, <laughs> she's like Gumby arms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the zipper on Kate's jacket doesn't line up. There's blooms on the trees in the background that just obviously don't match the time of the year. There's some people who even believe that Kate's face in the photo was directly lifted from an old Vogue cover shoot. The tweet laying out that theory got us 46 million views at this point. It could also be the case that the the face in the Vogue shoot looks like the face in the photo because that's what her face looks like. But who am I to judge? Um, yesterday, Kate tweeted, Ben, uh, like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared yesterday caused. Uh, Vox had a big analysis of all this, as they do. Talked about Kate's reliability and how weird it is for her not to show up because yeah. she always shows up. Um, She's supposed to be the reliable one. She is the, yeah. yeah. So, I don't know, man. The, the, like, she, this woman, she posed for the paparazzi 24 hours after giving birth several times. Uh, she doesn't know those fucking assholes anything. I have to admit that I didn't really care about this until I saw the hilarious Photoshop memes. But what's your take? Where, what's happening here? All right. I mean, I, I have a lot to say about this. I mean, because th- there's a lot, there's so many, like, just Crack another drink, So listeners. many, No, but there's so many dimensions to this, okay? So first of all, the explanation is, is, is kind of insane, right? Because- That, the, that she herself was well, editing I, this. I, well, first of all, they insist on telling us that William took this picture, right? Um, which is kind of strange. Um, these people have other people that can take pictures. Right, they're um, surrounded by staff. And, and, and then her explanation, well, like everybody else, I, I wanted to play around with this. When I play around with a photo, I don't make my arms like <laughs> twice as long and, and cut out parts of my kid's wrist and, and hands. And, you know, yeah. I, I change the filter, you know, uh, right. I, I crop it a little bit. Like, why would you edit your photo to, to make it weird and, and to remove body parts? And, you know, I, I, like, like, I think what the theory is, is that sometimes there's photos. A lot of people do this where like, you take a photo of six people in a family. Three of them look good. Three look bad. So yeah. you grab faces from other photos and put them on. Do you? Is that a one. thing? I, oh, yeah. I, like, I, like, that's because that's kind of weird. Yeah, but, it's weird. But, it, but they didn't just change your face. Like, do you change your arms when you do that? Some, like, I like, mean, like, Gumby I, arms are sexy. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> All right, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, small comment, but like, I remember uh, when I was reading this, like, the, <laughs> the Associated Press just describes revoking a photo is a kill notification. Yeah, it seemed a little over the I top, just huh? I was a little aggressive. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> we have issued a kill notification on the Kate Milton photo. I was like, what Phrasing, the, yeah. who are these people at the Associated <laughs> Press, about? you know? Um, okay, so we're just going to go into totally irresponsible okay. uh, speculation, right? I live there. Because basically, okay, what, what are, like I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out the conspiracy theories, right? So there's the conspiracy theory, the sad one, right? That she has like a real health issue and and just is being really super, like Lloyd Austin about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this is like a Lloyd Austin situation, except a little bit longer. Um, and also in a job where your appearance is constantly judged and yeah. picked in the most cruel way possible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you may not just want to deal with that if you're going through some shit. And that, it, if that's the case, like that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the internet, uh, like, like internet sleuths, as, as you'd mm-hmm. say, you know, there are all these other theories. Like, is their marriage in trouble? Like, is right. William up to no good? Like- you know, there, there, there are all these things that, um, you know, speak to the royal family's uh, endless penchant for gossip. What I will say about this is, number one, can we get some better communications people at the palace, though? Because, like, the communication strategy around this, like, whatever the answer is, they they are not getting good advice here. You know, no. <laughs> like, 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 from putting out the doctored Couldn't photo worse. to kind of being totally opaque about this. And, and I'm look. I'm always sensitive. You know, uh, like maybe it's not their fault. Maybe they're they're just getting rolled by crazy principles. We've all been there too. But so whether the fault is with the royals themselves or with the staff, like th- there does need to be some transparency here. Like th- this, they're subsidized. But I mean, I, everybody rightly points out it sucks for these people that they get photographed. They also get to live in a bunch of palaces and be billionaires without doing anything other than like showing up at ribbon cuttings. Right, so seems sweet. It seems like there's a need to just be a little transparent. And then the, my, my, my hottest take here, Tommy, is, man, like the queen seemed to be holding this whole operation together. You know, There's a lot of like, that. That was like the, the appearance for years was like, it seems like the queen is really like the boss. Of the, they called it the firm and she's kind of the senior partner. You know, 
Queen exits the stage and it's like all hell's breaking loose. You know, like Harry's got books coming out about fist fights with his brother. He and Megan are still hanging out in, in Santa Barbara. Kate can't be seen, like not sure what William's up to. Um, Charles doing his best, but um, poor Charles now has diagnosed his, with cancer. Has cancer, and we don't know how serious that right. is. You know, like so, it just feels or even like, what, uh, or even what kind of cancer? Yes, yeah. we just don't know. Yeah, so it's just the the you know, it's not looking great over there. No, it's scary. All we know is that Charles does not have prostate cancer. We don't know what's going on. So there is a real like line of succession issue, and they here probably as well. know. I mean, this whole thing, they just need to be a little more they, like transparency is always your friend in communications. Yeah. So what happens next? I mean, I guess you just have to figure out a time when you bring in the interview, some you, one friendly you, media right? Don't member. You think, and, I mean, now I'll ask you the question as a, as a communications strate- strategist extraordinaire. I mean, is the answer here like uh, a sit down interview where they're holding hands? Is the answer like, um, you know, uh, a carefully managed like you know documentary mm. is it like a written thing like what, what do you do here well obviously pod save the world would be number one yeah. two imagine if they had a sense of humor and they just started putting yeah. out hilariously photoshopped there you go that's the other way to go that's the other way to go fucking snapchat filter videos <laughs> all over their instagram yeah like you've my, had so much fun with this my daughter when i facetime her now has figured out you know how to put like a lizard head on or mm. an alien head they, they, you could do that you know yeah lizette really um really really likes facetime but likes to grab the camera and kind of like and sometimes wonders like when my mom was here in person was sort of wondering why she wasn't in the phone i think well i i have to say like no my wife's gonna kill me for this but like so my daughter likes to do the animal heads but the other day i was talking to her and like half the conversation she's got the turd head and i'm <laughs> and, and i'm just like come on I'm like, can we just change can we go back to like the the dinosaur head Something or the cute the cute dog head you know like this is not good yeah but yeah. they could do that kate could you know be like call a press conference online and do that it would know? be so funny and that that would be funny just release a bunch of terrible photoshops yeah I mean, hopefully there's not something serious underpinning this. No, no, no. Yeah, Like yeah, the best we, case, right? Is she like got a nose job or some sort yeah, of elective yeah. surgery? Yeah. Uh, you know, like hopefully it's something. No, like, I, that. like we should be clear. Like we, I've always liked Kate, you know, um, uh, and she seemed like the rock, right? So that's why people are a little, you know, unsteady about this. Dwayne and the so, Rock Johnson? Uh, <laughs> John Cena, naked. Uh, did you <laughs> that see was, that? By the way, that was, that was, that was a nice. lot. That was a lot. Um, yes. Like, it's always weird when people have like Audi abs, like your abs are so ripped, they kind of extend outward. Like yeah, Cena? yeah, yeah. You know, you know what I'm yeah. saying, Alona? He's we'll just it. so ripped. It's like, what's happening? I feel like we've made Alona laugh today more than that. Makes <laughs> she's me feel just good. About it. <laughs> <laughs> she's just yeah, it's, it's wishful thinking. I don't know. But yeah, like, I, like, like. Unfortunately, the the best explanation would be the worst news, which is that she's really dealing with some issues, and we hope that's not the case. And if it's not the case, yeah, then do your advice. Everyone is entitled to their privacy about all things medical so yeah. I, could, I could imagine why you wouldn't want to release information before you're ready i mean that's basically what happened to lloyd austin right you've got this scary news about his health he didn't want to put it out there yeah. he's a very private person whatever but when you're in these public positions you kind of know that you don't know that this level of crazy is going to happen but you know when you're a a royal you know what the paparazzi does and the amount of speculation and there's this whole cottage industry built around you well and as as royal observer um you know, part of what Kate's usually been very good at this. Like Kate has been the one who's handled this, like you know, very elegantly for a very long time. So, um, so that that does make you worry that there's something not great going on. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? I mean, yeah, who, who knows? knows? Uh, okay, well, that's all the speculation from us. Uh, yeah. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, you'll hear Ben's interview with Renata Segura about the situation in Haiti. So please stick around for that. So last week, we talked uh, about the situation in Haiti um, after armed gangs kind of banded together, uh, stormed prisons, released thousands of inmates, fought with police. The prime minister had been in uh, Kenya trying to finalize a deal for Kenyan uh, police forces to come to Haiti. Um, but then he was prevented from returning to the country. And now... The prime minister has officially resigned uh, following a transition council being established. The U.S. military is uh, helping to airlift non-essential staff from the U.S. embassy. Uh, Other countries have done the same. So it's a very chaotic situation. Um, Thankfully, to help us shed light on the situation uh, today is Renata Segura, who is the deputy program director uh, for the International Crisis Group uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, ICG is obviously a tremendous organization that has helped us uh, make sense of difficult events in the past. So Renata, thanks so much for, for joining us. No, thank you for having me. So uh, you, you you and your team have done a lot of reporting on the situation in Haiti. Um, 
wh- how would you describe for people that are not following it that closely, um, just what has been going on in the last few days and weeks? Uh, what are the major players and, and, and what do they want? Why are they making this move right now, the gangs? So we have seen a radical change of strategy and really of what's happening in Haiti since um, last Sunday, a week ago. Um, essentially, since the assassination of President uh, Jovenel Moïse in 2021, we have seen um, a strengthening of the gangs. We should probably note that gangs have been historically a feature of Haitian politics for a very, very long time, for decades. And they had been a sort of private army for either political or commercial elites that have used them to further their interests. Uh, after the assassination of Moïse, um, we have seen that these gangs had been strengthening. They had been gaining more and more territorial control. Um, and we have also seen some separation between these elites and, and the gangs, um, in part because of the sanctions that have been imposed, particularly by Canada, on several um, very high profile politicians, including ex-president Martelly, that had so, sort of sent a message on to some of the elites that they shouldn't continue supporting the, the gangs, at least not so openly. Um, so with that, we had seen a shift um, in the way in which the gangs had been operating, and they had transferred um, their attention to really extort uh, private companies and, and individuals and also kidnapping. And they were doing that to make up for the lost revenues um, that, that they were not being, they weren't receiving from, from these elites. However, until very recently, what we had seen was a confrontation between gangs, right? Mm-hmm. G9 and GPEP, which are the two biggest coalitions, were fighting each other to take control of more territory, and more territory obviously means more power and more money. However, as Crisis Group noted in the report that we published last January, there had been a building of a coalition between the gangs something that Charissier, one of the most notorious gang leaders, um, has called Vive Sam, which in Creole means living together. This was a very short-lived coalition that took place um, last fall, in which he had said, for the good of the people, we're going to stop fighting. That fell apart very quickly. However, we knew from sources in the ground that the gang leaders kept communications lined open Mm -hmm. and that they were thinking that they could bring together this coalition again if the multinational support mission that um, was approved by the UN and is being led by Kenya was to arrive or eventually to fight the state. And so that is what has been happening in the last week. So we have gone from a scenario in which gangs were fighting each other and now we have a scenario in which gangs are allied together fighting the state. Um, this has been obviously a message for Henry, uh, who, as you noted, was out of the country and they were asking for his resignation. But we very much think it was also a message for the Kenyans. And they were saying, we are going to be a force to be reckoned with if you decide to come. Um, and, and so that is the situation where we are today with the gangs um, allied you know, ready to confront uh, a multinational support mission if it is to arrive um, and searching to expand uh, to control. At this point, almost they have the majority of the city and and they could uh, soon control 100 percent of Port-au-Prince and then likely expand to the rest of the country. Okay, well, that's that's quite clear. So essentially, the prime minister, prime minister Henri goes to Kenya to kind of finalize this mission. And so the gangs make the move while he's out of the country to prevent that Kenyan mission from coming in. Uh, and they seem to have succeeded in doing that in the short term um, and also may have succeeded in you know, preventing Prime Minister Henri from kind of resuming whatever governing authority he had, which is probably not much to begin with. Um, before we get into kind of what the options are um, for dealing with this situation, um, I-, I just want to ask uh, from the reporting that your team has done. Uh, you know, when we look at this from the outside, we see kidnappings, we see, you know, people being killed. Um, what Do you have any sense of what life is like for just ordinary people on the ground uh, in Port-au-Prince in, in, the, in this circumstance? Yes. I mean, it has been very, very difficult until now, and it has just increasingly worsened um, in the last week. So until, until let's 
say two weeks ago, what we had was very strong territorial control by the gangs. So people would only be able to leave their neighborhood to go to work, for example, if they had permission from the gangs. The gangs were also very interested in having people stay in the territories they controlled, you know, like even though there's hundreds of thousands of displaced people in, in Haiti at the moment, uh, the gangs were trying to prevent that from happening. So for example, if a family has three people that work, only one person will be able to leave the neighborhood. There was incredible amounts of sexual violence that being exerted. Uh, women were being uh, forced to be sexual partners of the gangs. Um, and there was obviously a humanitarian situation in terms of access to food, to health services. Schools have been closed for a very long time. And with a crumbling state, essentially no, no protection services were being offered. That has only made it, been made worse in, in the last uh, week because um, particularly access to gasoline is incredibly important in Haiti. Most homes in, in Haiti don't have electricity and they depend on plants that are run by gasoline. People have not been able to leave their houses to get gasoline. So that means they don't have electricity and the majority of the people also have water plants because there are, there's no portable water that comes into their houses. And people are running out of food, but when you leave the house, there's so much violence on the street that you really are risking your life. So what we're seeing is that people have been inside uh, and, and, and they're running out of food. And for those people that have been hurt uh, by the violence that is occurring on the streets, there's almost no health services. The, the gangs have ransacked the biggest hospitals. Uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders and other international organizations have small clinics, but they are clearly overwhelmed. Not to mention people that just have regular medical emergencies that need to be attended, women that are pregnant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, Haiti had already a humanitarian emergency in terms of food. More than half of the country needed food assistance, 30% in what the World Food Program calls critical access. Um, and that is just gone uh, through the roof uh, in, in the last week. So it's it's really nightmare scenario what we have right now. So, I mean, you're, you know, what you're describing sounds like both the, the definition of a, a failed state, essentially, with gangs having more power than any governing authority and a humanitarian catastrophe uh, that could get worse as people uh, lack food and water, uh, potable water. Um, you know, the, even the proposals that uh, are now on hold of having, you know, one to 2,000 largely Kenyan police come in to support what is already a pretty small, uh, I think, under 10,000 active duty police in Haiti, um, it just feels insufficient to deal with the, the scale of the challenge you describe. I mean, what um, what kind of recommendations uh, has Crisis Group made and, and what do you think the international community um, should be thinking about in terms of options for, for dealing with the situation? Yes, the, the, the situation is very dire and, and the announcement from of the Kenyans that they are going to put pause until there is a more clear governance structure in place in Haiti does make the situation uh, very complicated. I mean, for very understandable reasons, Haitians have been very reluctant to international forces coming into the country, right? There is a long history from co colonial times to invasions by the U.S., by, through the um, sort of checkered uh, results of MINUSTA, etc., that have left people with a very sour taste. However, at this precise moment, because the situation is so dire, um, most of the Haitians that we have spoken to are very, very supportive of the idea of the mission. And really what we are hearing from Haiti uh, today is true panic at the sense that nobody is going to come and help. Um, simultaneously, the U.S. has made it very clear that they are not keen on sending troops, um, at least not at the moment. Uh, I would imagine that if boatloads of Haitian migrants start arriving in Florida, that might change the calculation. Uh, but at, at this point, it isn't. What we're hoping is that this governance structure that was proposed um, or that came out of the meeting in CARICOM yesterday sort of takes place quickly. Um, and, and then the Kenyans feel that they do have a counterpart in Haiti that would be sufficient. Um, and, and that the Kenyans get some sort of support from other um, donor troop contributor countries um, and and are able to land in the country. I mean, obviously, the idea of an invasion by U.S. security forces seems like not really a recommendable notion. 
But the fact that the security situation is such uh, as what we're seeing right now, it also it, it's a, a tremendous challenge for the Kenyans who were sending, let's remember, police and not military. Uh, and so what what it was supposed to be a mission that was going to go into the neighborhoods to gain control of um, roads, of you know, s safeguarding state uh, structures has now turned into something more complicated. So it seems unlikely that they are going to be able to successfully do the work against the gangs unless they are uh, accompanied by a more robust um, military force, even if just temporarily to allow them to to settle into the country. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, however, we do think it is very important to keep lines of communications with the gangs open. Um, and, and I think it is important to make a distinction here, right? Uh, Sherry Sia, who has become sort of the spokesperson for, for the gangs, does have political ambitions himself. He has hoped to be part of government in the past, and I'm sure he would be um, hoping that, that they will be included in, in this new transitional government. That seems really far-fetched, and I, I don't think neither the, um, the Haitians nor the international community will really be supportive of that idea. However, there are multiple people in Haiti, because the gangs have existed for so long, they have good channels of communication to them. And we're talking about local people, you know, members of the church, local leaders, that have been negotiating humanitarian access in certain neighborhoods that have been, you know, helping with specific people or movement, etc. Those channels of communication are vital at this moment to negotiate with the gangs some sort of violence reduction, particularly to protect the population, but also to eventually allow this uh, new government to take shape. Um, obviously, the gangs have the upper hand at this moment. Um, and so it's going to be very difficult to convince them to step down. But if they were to see a force that comes that looks strong enough that it will really, you know, give them a run for their money, um, I think there will be a, a bit of intimidation. It is, it's difficult to know because right now there's almost no counterpart for the gangs yeah. to know how strong they would be if they were faced with a well-trained um, force such as the one that Kenya has, Benin has also offered troops, etc. Right? It, it's a different calculation to see them now when they have the run of the place, vis-a-vis -vis what would be the case if there was some some serious security forces that that would be facing them. So what we're hoping is that there could be a two-prong approach. Clearly, a, a security intervention is at this point the only solution to at least bring the violence down a little bit, but also we're hoping that that the local government and also hopefully the international community do keep these uh, lines of communication open and try and convince the gang leadership that it is in their best interest to lower the violence, particularly um, against the communities. So it, it sounds like, you know, what you're saying is there needs to be probably a bigger international force than even the Kenyan contingent um, in order to both try to stabilize things and maybe to create a basis for some negotiation with the gangs. Right now, there's no reason for the gangs to, to negotiate if they have control. Uh, another part of this equation, as you mentioned, is the political structure in Haiti itself. Um, the U.S. government had kind of uh, supported uh, the idea of a transition uh, from Prime Minister Henri. Um, uh, the U.S. State Department urged a transition so as to facilitate a multinational security mission, you mentioned uh, CARICOM, the Caribbean country's meeting, um, to try to work through what a, a transition might look like. I mean, if if Prime Minister Henri seems like he's moving out of the picture here, um, what do you think the, the kind of transition uh, plan should be for Haiti's government? Um, is it is it even feasible? Because uh, the U.S. always ties these things to elections, but you know, elections sometimes don't solve any problems. They just kind of create another vehicle for uh, unrest and instability. I mean, w w how do you see the political situation that is required in Haiti going forward to make this work? I mean, I think what came out of the CARICOM meeting yesterday is is, is promising, and it's something that could work. Um, it, it, understanding that Henry is out of the picture. It, it's sort of unfortunate that he has taken this long for Henry to um, except to resign. I think this is 
the 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 sort of main structure was agreed yesterday in in Jamaica is the main structure that has been discussed in political negotiations in Haiti for the last almost two years. So this is not incredibly innovative, and what it does, it sort of um, echoes the structures that are created by the Haitian Constitution. So we're talking about um, what it, they're calling a presidential council which will be for now a replacement of the president right we don't we don't have a president so this presidential council will have seven people um and those people will be representatives both of the main political groups or the main political alliances but also um public sector i'm sorry private sector and um key uh, so civil society groups such as the montana court which has been kind of the leading voice of the opposition um, coming from civil society. So that would be one part of the government. And then once that uh, presidential council is formed, they will come together and appoint a prime minister and that prime minister will appoint a minister, um, the, its cabinet. And so that sort of uh, presidential council, prime minister and, and cabinet would be um, the Transitional government. I, I think that calling for elections at this point would be completely insane. Yeah. There hasn't been electoral authorities in Haiti for a long time. Um, from the technical perspective, it would be almost impossible to know where people are, uh, so that they could come to the voting polls. Um, and we have seen in the past how uh, poorly prepared elections have actually, um, not helped. Uh, they've been very detrimental for the stability of Haiti. So running into a, 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 an election of that sort uh, would be a mistake. Uh, however, if we do have a, a transitional government that represents the majority, they're never, it's never going to represent every single Haitian, right? But if it does represent the majority of the political and, and social forces of Haiti, um, and it can work together to bring the mission and to work with uh, foreign partners to try and address the security and humanitarian um situation then at least that will be a start it's not going to be easy Haitians have been fighting on the small um you know where the details of of what these governments should look like for a long time um caricom had asked them to bring forward a proposal and they couldn't get together they, they couldn't agree on one so they ended up uh, sending seven proposals to to caricom and it was only yesterday when in jamaica everybody Lock the doors, call people on Zoom, and was like, we have to come up with one agreement, and that's it. And nobody leaves until we do that. It, it, it is too bad that it, it had to become such a terrible crisis before everybody came to the table with the willingness to to make uh, these kinds of compromises. But hopefully now there is an understanding of what would be the terrible risk if this government doesn't work. Um, and that it's really the only way forward for Haiti to be able to start addressing the other the other two terrible crises that that it has. So so we're hopeful that um, you know within the next day or two we should have the names of who are these people that are going to be part of the presidential council, um, and soon thereafter the name of of the new prime minister. So last question. I mean, part of what you're describing, what's interesting here is you have lots of different countries playing a role here. You've got CARICOM, the Caribbean neighbors of Haiti. You've got Kenya and Benin potentially providing these uh, troops uh, or police. Um, you obviously have the, the Haitians themselves. In terms of the U.S., which is now drawing down part of our embassy, has this very complicated and often bad history uh, of intervention in Haitian politics, um, but you know has more resources than anybody else in the in the, in the hemisphere or well, the world really. Um, what what do you recommend the U.S. policy be going forward? Where, where can the U.S. try to help in, in this circumstance? I mean, I think obviously speeding the support to the multinational support mission is going to be crucially important. Uh, we know that's not, you know, the government's um, prerogative exclusively, and uh, some of this money has been stuck in Congress uh, and it hasn't been approved. So that is problematic. But really trying to solve that issue um, and find ways to bring uh, the the key equipment um, that the Kenyans need and the support, be it in kind or or in cash. Um, it's hugely uh, relevant. Um, I think the U.S. also has been, um, until now, um, I think for the U.S., and they're not the only actor, um, 
they're used to only working with their institutional counterparts, right? And they were very attached to um, Henry as a counterpart because it was it, it made sense, right? He had been appointed with a kind of iffy process, but a little bit of legitimacy. But there needs to be an understanding that the social forces in Haiti go beyond the institutions and that with such a state in crumbles, there needs to be consultation that is very wide and open. And that's something that hadn't happened uh, for the international community was very reluctant to engage with civil society in Haiti for a very long time, honestly, for way too long. And that was part of what dragged this political crisis that long. So I think from now on, understanding that, that what's happening in Haiti is very different than what's happening in other parts of the world and that there needs to be an engagement with social forces too will yeah. be key. Yeah. But I think there is one thing that has been incredibly um important and that we've been haunting on this for a long time but nothing has happened is that a lot of the weapons that are being used by the by the haitian gangs come from the united states um and they come mostly from florida they are purchased in the states and then they are um, hidden in the cargo that takes other products into haiti um and this is a relatively easy problem to solve um it's one that for some reason, uh, well, for a political reason that I think we can all imagine what is the political reason behind the reluctance to get involved in that. Um, there's been very little action on the parts of the states. But at this point, if the gangs are not receiving new weapons, if they're not receiving particularly more ammunition, the equation on the ground would change dramatically. Um, and this is something that it would not be very costly and it would be actually fairly feasible for the United States to do right away. Yeah. Um, I think experts have identified out of what ports these guns are uh, leaving Florida. Uh, and so that, that should be really straightforward. And, and we're hoping that this tremendous crisis is what finally pushes the American government to do that. Well, in a sane world, we would not have guns, uh, weapons of war for sale uh, across the United States, but in a world where we do, the least we could do is try to stop those weapons from moving to Haiti. Um, look, thank you so much for uh, giving us so much information. Uh, we really appreciate it, and hopefully uh, people will listen uh, to the, the the recommendations coming from Crisis Group on this. Um, so again, uh, thanks for your work, and, and uh, we'll keep in touch on this. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to Renata Segura for joining the show. Uh, and uh, Aaron Rodgers, man, I don't know. Might be a better VP than a quarterback these days. Uh, yeah, we might need a kill notification on that one. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it's like, I can't believe they called it a kill notification. Just, I kept reading that, that story. Like, it's really jarring. You know, it's like, like, I don't know, you just, it's just a Photoshop, guys. Just not yeah, printing yeah, the yeah, photo because they have weird fingers, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> weird sausage hands. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's it for us. Talk to you guys next week.